Greetings in the name of Jesus from Riviera Apostolic Church. This is, I am Pastor Behan, and tonight I want to give you a Bible study that you can read along and, and go along with us as we delve into the scriptures on the plan of salvation. I want to move along with this so that it will be a Bible study that you can go back to and, and read the scripture in today's world where there's a lot of confusion and a lot of, of question on how we can be saved, we need some clear instruction. And so tonight I want to delve into the Word of God and simplify this as much as I can. And we are presenting to you a Bible study that is uh, prepared and it is called Into His Marvelous Light. When walking out of a dark room into the sunshine, a light can be blinding. And as our eyes accustomed to the light, we can see more clearly and enjoy the scenery that surrounds us. Likewise, when we look into the light of the scriptures, the brightness of the truth can sometimes hurt. However, as our spiritual eyesight becomes adjusted, we can enjoy walking in the light of the truth. The Bible is designed to allow us to walk into the marvelous light of God's Word, and tonight we will be journeying into the Scriptures by imagining that we are back in the days of Jesus and His Apostles, listening to them teach and preach the plan of salvation. In order to do this, we will be careful to rightly divide or interpret the Word of Truth, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, and by concentrating on the highlights of the three main divisions, of the New Testament in chronological order. These include the Gospels, which cover the words and works of Jesus Christ, the Acts of the Apostles, covering the actions and the preaching of the Apostles, and the Epistles, the covering of the letters written by the Apostles to the churches that they started in the book of Acts. We believe that the Scriptures are divinely inspired and, there are, and they are of no private interpretation. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 tells us, therefore, that every effort has been made to present the pure word of God without adding to or taking away from its teaching. Deuteronomy 4 and 2 and Proverbs 35 and 6 says, It is not our intention, neither do we desire to convince you of our own personal ideas or the creeds of any denomination. We simply desire to present the word of God and the truth as it is written in his scriptures. Only by claiming the Bible as our sole authority can any of us be confident of our salvation. For it is the word of God and not the traditions of men that will judge us all in the end. Let us read 2 Timothy 3 verses 15 and 16 as we begin our journey into the word of God. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we will begin with into the Gospels. And in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5 and verse 14. It says, The Word which it was in the beginning was God, and it became flesh. And Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. Go ahead and read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now I want to go to John 1 in verses 11 through 13, and read these verses. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So if we believe in him and receive him, Jesus gives us power to become the sons of God. By a supernatural birth, and he spoke further about this new birth one night to a ruler of the Jews. John 3, verses 1 through 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know what thou art, that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So it is every one that is born of the Spirit. So here in John 3, 1 through 8, the Lord told Nicodemus, Nicodemus that everyone who wanted to see or enter the kingdom of God must be born of water and of spirit. John 3, 16, verse, John 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So Jesus also told Nicodemus that so, whosoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. Here it seemed that Jesus mentioned two entirely different requirements for salvation. One was being born again, the other is believing. And some might believe, some might think that that was a contradiction. But this was absolutely not a contradiction. And the next scripture will explain how believing is related to experiencing the birth of the Spirit. And that's found in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should, should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So here we discover that if we believe on him, we will receive his spirit. We find that the, scripture, the scriptural belief is more than just a change in the way we think. It also results in a scriptural experience. Faith motivates us to obey, and obedience brings us to acceptance and blessings. When we believe as the scripture has said, it will cause an action within us. That action is the plan of salvation, which calls us to repentance 
and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. John 12, verses 35 and 36, and 42 and 43. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So today, just as in Jesus' day, many do believe on him, but they will not confess him for fear of what others will do or say. Many of us have probably ran into that problem where we believe, but we don't want to say anything because we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be ridiculed or persecuted. John 12 44 through 48. Let's read that. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So here in Jesus', here in Jesus prayer for his disciples, just before his crucifixion, he said God's word is truth. So we must be careful not to reject it. Rather, we should believe and obey His Word, no matter what others say or do. John chapter 17, verses 17 through 20. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. As Thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. In Jesus' prayer for his disciples, just before his, his crucifixion, he said that God's word is truth. He also prayed for us. And for all those who would believe on him, through the Apostle's word. To find out what the Apostle's message was to be, let us read what Jesus told them to proclaim. The setting of the following Great Commission Scripture in Luke 20, chapter 24, verses 45 through 49, is just after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, and just before His ascension into heaven. It says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. The apostles preached the message Jesus commanded them to proclaim. And the promise of the Father was then fulfilled. So let us continue in our journey into the Word of God by seeing what was preached and what happened at Jerusalem. 
we will begin the second part of this Bible study and go into the Acts of the Apostles. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, we find that as we enter the book of Acts, we discover almost immediately that the promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. And were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And when and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Persia and Pamphylia in Egypt in, in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, Those men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass, it shall come to pass, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So when the apostles were at Jerusalem, they along with many others were joyously filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance or the inspiration to speak it. The amazed onlookers from many nations who heard them speaking with tongues in their own tongue, they began to ask, what, what, what does this mean? Then Peter explained the promise coming of the Spirit and went on to preach Christ and the original apostolic plan of salvation. Jesus had told Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you the plan of salvation. And you're going to preach this plan of salvation and establish my church here on earth. And so when they asked him, he began to let them know what that plan was. And we will read that in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 39. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So when they asked Peter, whom God had given the plan of salvation, what is it, Peter, that we must do to be saved? Peter, being endued with this plan that God had given him, told them, you have to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He didn't say that it's a possibility. He didn't say that this is something that you can do and try to... It was a concrete plan that God had given him. You have to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The power is in the name. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not a name. They are titles. He was the Father of creation. He was the Son that redeemed us. And He was the Holy Ghost that came back from heaven as the Comforter. We receive that Holy Ghost within us today. But the titles have no power within them. It's the name. I'm a son. I'm a father. And I'm a minister. But if I write you a check and I put the father or the son or the minister on that check, they won't cash it unless I put my name on there. Likewise, the name of Jesus Christ is the only name given among men whereby we can be saved. When the people heard this, they believed his words. And they believed that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. And they were sorry for their sins, and they asked Peter and the apostles what should they do, and Peter told them. He replied by preaching the message that Jesus commanded to be preached in Luke 24, 45-49. And in light of this, consider the three elements of the plan of salvation that Peter preached to them in Acts 2 and verse 38. It was repentance, the remission of sins through the baptism of Jesus Christ. And the word baptism comes from baptismo, which means to be buried in Christ. We are buried in Christ, and we die to sin, and we come forth a new creature. And then receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is that gift that God gives us, and it is a gift for everyone that would receive it. It is the fulfillment of the two new birth requirement that Jesus mentioned in John 3 and 5. That were, that were necessary to enter into the kingdom of God. The water and the birth equaled the baptism in the name of Jesus. Jesus never meant for the plan of salvation to be muddy or to be confusing or to be something that was interpreted as anything other than what he said. Now let's look, now let's look at other examples of people who were born again of the water and of the Spirit as Jesus gave his apostles continued as the word that Jesus gave his apostles continued to be preached throughout the book of Acts Philip preaching to the Samaritans in chapter 8 of the book of Acts notice that some of the people say when they experienced the Holy Ghost they experienced joy or when they believed in Jesus or when they were baptized they were automatically filled with the Holy Ghost but what does the word say? In Acts 8 and verses 5 through 8, what does it say there? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Did they have joy? Absolutely they did. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Did they believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, they did. Verse 14 through 17. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Were they baptized in the name of Jesus? Yes, they were. Did they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost as a separate and distinct experience? Yes, they did. And Peter preaching to the Gentiles in Acts 10. Notice some people say that being religious today is enough. You don't need to be baptized. Or that the spirit baptism evidenced by tongues in the book of Acts was only for the day of Pentecost in the biblical days. If the Bible says this, then that's true. But if the Word of God shows us through Cornelius' experience that this is not true, then it is not. So let's go into Acts chapter 10 and read verses 1 through 2. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So this was a devout man. This was a religious man. He gave offerings and, and tithes to the, to the church. He lived a good life. He did everything that he knew to do. Let's read verses 5 and 6. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So this religious and devout man obviously had to do something else. Because now they're saying, call for Peter. Have him come and talk to you. Let's read verses 40 through 44 through 46. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, and let's go ahead and read verses 47 and 48. Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So this religious, devout man who gave alms to the poor and had paid his offerings and did all that he thought that he could do, God told him, said, call for Peter. So he called Peter. And they were in their house and they were praying. And, and when Peter got them, or got to them, they began to talk with Peter and Peter began to preach the gospel and they began to, to speak in tongues. And this was well after the day of Pentecost. But then Peter said, hey, you still have to be baptized. And so they were baptized. Was Cornelius a religious man? Absolutely he was. Did he receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues after the day of Pentecost? He certainly did. Did God have more for him to do than just being a religious and devout man? Yes, he did. And did they still have to be baptized in the name of Jesus? Yes, they did. Paul preaching to the disciples, to John's disciples in Acts 19, noticed that many of the people who are believers have not even heard about the Holy Ghost in this passage of scripture that is promised to them. And also some of those people say that it was not necessary to be baptized or rebaptized. And if you were rebaptized by John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, would you think that it would be necessary to be to be rebaptized? This is the man that baptized Jesus. Would you need to be rebaptized? 
Others say it doesn't matter what is spoken when you're baptized, whether it's in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whether it is in the name of Jesus. It doesn't really matter. A lot of people in the world will tell you today. But if the Bible indicates that it doesn't matter, then it doesn't. But if the Bible indicates that it does, then it does. And let's read what the book of Acts says in chapter 19 and verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And let's read verse 3 and 5. 3 through 5. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's go ahead and go to verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So were these people believers? And had they heard or received the Holy Ghost? They were believers, but they had not heard or received the Holy Ghost. And did those believers who were baptized by John the Baptist have to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus? Yes, they did. Was receiving the Holy Ghost accompanied by the evidence of speaking with other tongues when they did that? Yes, it was. Although they were baptized by the same man that baptized Jesus, he merely baptized with the baptism unto repentance. But they were commanded to be rebaptized because they weren't baptized in the name of Jesus, which is where the power of forgiveness and remission of your sins comes from. We have found that the apostles preached the following salvation message, the life of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, repentance toward God and belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior. That belief causes a reaction that is the baptism in water by, by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. And that entitles them to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost accompanied by the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. Each time you read in the book of Acts, this is the same thing that happened each and every time. It never changed. And it still hasn't changed. Peter told them back in Acts 2 and 39. He said, for this promise is unto you and your children and all them that are far off. And speaking that it was them and their children and all them that are far off. He's speaking into generations of the future. Your children and those children's children and their children's children and all them that keep going far into the future. Today... The plan of salvation has not changed. God says, my word is forever settled in heaven. It never changes. Now let us read what the apostles had to say about the message of salvation that they proclaimed in the book of Acts. We can do this by reading the epistles or the letters that they wrote their converts. <coughs> Excuse me. We will go to the third part of our Bible study today into the epistles. And as we read the epistles, we will notice how strongly the apostles felt about the gospel or the good news of salvation. This is not because they were being judgmental. It is because they knew the word Jesus had given them to proclaim was going to judge all men in the end. So what did Peter say? He said, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, being born again by the word of God, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. 1 Peter 
1, 22 through 25. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So here we see that obedience to God's word purifies our soul. 1 Peter 4 17 and 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So Peter asked the question, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And Paul gave the answer. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7 through 9, he said, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. It is eternally important it is eternally imperative that we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Paul say? But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say we now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. In, in Galatians 7 through 9, there is only one gospel. The Bible repeats it over and over. There is only one God. There is only one God. Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Those are the titles of God Almighty. But Jesus is his name and the power of forgiveness and the power of salvation and the power of healing all power in heaven and earth is in the name of jesus what did james say he said receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls be ye doers of the word and not hearers only many hear the truth but there are very few that will be doers of the truth Many believe in God, but there are many there, but there are very few that will confess him openly and publicly. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of a man he was. The word is able to save our souls. James tells us that if we see something that we need to do, we look into the mirror of the Word of God. We should do that. And let us now consider what we will do with what we have heard. We have heard the plan of salvation as God gave it unto Peter. Do you believe the Word of God is true and that it will judge you? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is is God Almighty, that He is the Lord and Savior. Do you believe that it's necessary to repent by determining to turn from sin and giving your life to God? Do you believe what He said, that you have to repent, you have to turn away from your sins, and you have to ask God to forgive you for that, and let Him know that you are genuine and you are sincere and that you want to live for Him? And do you believe that the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is the biblical way to be baptized? Over and over and over again, he says, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Over and over again, he baptized those that, or they baptized those that were baptized in the New Testament in the water. There are those that will tell you that the water is of a natural birth. But we read to you scripture that said this is not a God speaking about natural. The, the flesh is flesh. The spirit is spirit. But this is the spirit. God didn't mean to confuse you. God didn't mix them. He said exactly what he meant. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Your sins are not taken away. He said once you're baptized and covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, He removes your sin and puts them as far as the east is from the west. That is the only time in your life that you are completely sinless. And that is when you are buried in the blood of Jesus Christ by water baptism. Do you believe that baptism of the Holy Ghost is for you today? Trust me, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. He said, it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you believe that you will receive the Holy Ghost and that you will speak in other tongues just as they did in the Bible? If you don't believe that, let me tell you, I have seen it happen thousands and thousands of times. And it is something that is a natural thing that God has given us. It is the gift that he promised in the book of Acts through, the, through his plan of salvation. I will tell you now that if you do believe these things, you could pray right now. And you could ask God to allow you to experience all that He has for you. Because He said if you seek Him, He will lead and guide you into all truth. And to the sound of my voice, and if you're watching this, this recording right now on this Bible study, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what part of the world you are in or where you're at right now. You can repent and you can find a minister to baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ that is filled with the Holy Ghost. And God will give you that gift that He has promised you. There are some supplemental study scriptures that I will read to you. And I'm trying to hurry this along. But you can look these up in your Bible and you can read these, these supplemental study scriptures. One is Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. God's warning regarding false prophets and the importance of being a doer and not just a hearer of the word. This world is full of false prophets that will tell you everything you want to hear, but they won't tell you the truth. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19 talks about where Peter was given the keys to the kingdom because of his revelation of who Jesus Christ was. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Mark 16, verse 15 through 18. Acts 4 and 12. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 19. Acts 8, verse 35 through 39. Acts 10, verse 34 through 43. 1 Peter 3, verses 21, or 20 and 21. And I could go on, but for the sake of time, I'm going to stop and just ask you, consider your salvation today. If there's a question about your salvation, just consider what I've said today. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm just asking you, let me show you Jesus. Let me introduce you to my God. Not the God out here that everybody else is saying. Not the charismatic way that says all ways lead to God. That's not true. That is false doctrine. That is false teaching. We encourage you to read through the Gospels and the Acts and the Epistles in detail. And we encourage you to pray that God would lead and guide you into all truth so that you may walk into His marvelous light. I am Pastor Behan. Thank you so much for joining us for this Bible study. We love you very much, and we pray that God will show you and, and lead you into the truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you once again.